Um, welcome everyone and, and happy Friday. Um, I hope you have a restful weekend planned, at least most of you, as I heard from the panelists in the call that um, uh, some of them are still on service over the weekend. So I hope, I hope you have some plans to rest and relax. Um, thank you so much for joining us for um, one of our regular faculty development webinar sessions. Um, I hope you are as excited as I am to hear uh, from our panelists today. Um, we have a stellar group of presenters, uh, your colleagues, and um, they, each of them will talk about different as aspects of um, um, virtual clinical teaching at and what we can do um, to optimize the learner experience with uh, virtual uh, clinical teaching. Um, I'm glad you're here. Um, what, um, what we're hoping to do, um, well, before that, let me introduce myself for those who don't know me. I see lots of familiar uh, names here. Um, great, thank you for introducing yourself. Um, good to see you all. Um, I'm, I'm Clariana Colomitro, and I'm the Director of uh, Educational Development with the Office of Professional Development Education Scholarship. Um, excited to see you all here. Um, and our panelists today are uh, Dr. Jessica Trier, Dr. David Taylor, Dr. Ramana Piretti, and Dr. Faisal Haji. Um, and um, as I was saying earlier, they will each talk briefly about different aspects of virtual clinical teaching. And we're hoping to have about 15 minutes or so at the very end for questions. So as you hear um, their talk, feel free to jot down any questions that come up. Um, you can use the Q&A feature of the webinar um, and I'll monitor those questions. If you prefer to use the chat forum, you can do as, that as well. I'll try and keep an eye on both. Um, and the other thing we could do at the end is um, I could um, give you the ability to chat so I can unmute you and um, you can ask your question that way, whatever your preference is. Um, before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone that this session will be recorded and will be made available afterwards uh, in our faculty development YouTube channel. Um, so if, if there are other colleagues that you know that wish they were here and they would still like to listen to this, um, please forward the link uh, once you receive it. Um, anything else? I'm looking at you, Katie, and that I need to um, remind everyone. I think that's about it. I want to leave uh, time to our presenters today. So, oh, my video and audio. What I'm gonna do, thank you, Andrea. How about I uh, stop my video? Um, and hopefully that will, that will improve the audio connection. All right, uh, the floor is all yours. And, and Ramana, I think you are going to get us all started. Yes, can you guys hear me? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Today, I will be talking about uh, uh, what are the technologies that you can use to optimize uh, clinical teaching uh, with virtual means uh, during this pandemic. And uh, um, so, so, these are my disclosures. I have uh, uh, some research funding to carry on uh, um, activities in uh, virtual care and uh, patient experience of care and health what comes from uh, uh, multiple sources. Um, and part of interest for this particular talk. Um, today I'll be discussing about the technologies that you could be using uh, for virtual care teaching. So uh, broadly, uh, the technology needed, I'll be discussing about these uh, various aspects. Most of you are very familiar with these audio, video, conference equipment, uh, computer or tablet, usually a large monitor, mobile unit, network, and a backup cover unit, and the peripherals and accessories. I'll be discussing uh, uh, about these in detail in uh, subsequent slides. So, um, before we go to the technology, I sort of messed up the order of the slide. So I'm just going to go. Uh, so this is one of the uh, mobile uh, units that we have put together in neurology 
to deal with virtual care teaching as well as bedside rounding. So, uh, so this is basically a, a readily deployed mobile app that we put together uh, with uh, local resources available to deliver high fidelity uh, uh, bedside. Uh, yeah. I have to interrupt for a second. Uh, your audio is is very bad. Is there any chance that you could phone in, uh, use your cell phone to call in to do the audio that way? Audio just just keep your connection. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You're very hard to hard to make out right now. Um, is it better now? Oh, uh, you have to talk for a bit to. Oh, is it better now? Can you hear me okay now? Still a little bit. You're, you're breaking up quite a bit. Yeah. Your connection. Okay. Um, not I'm not. Okay. Let me just dial in. Yes, what is the dial-in number? I don't have it on the Zoom invite. Okay, hang on a sec. Katie, do you know if there's a number that Ramana can dial into? Yep. Yep, Peter will send the number to Ramana. Um, I'm wondering, um, Jessica or David, is there a way? Yeah, David, that's great. If if you can get us started, Romana, Peter will will support you with the audio. I, I will. I will. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So uh, I'm going to get set up here. Uh, this is David Taylor. I'm. Uh, Internal Medicine Residency Program Director. And what I'm trying to do is uh, share my screen here. See if this works. We can okay. see it. Is that is that showing up? Are you seeing the notes view or the regular view? Notes view. Okay, you're seeing my notes. Okay. There we go. Okay, we're all set up? Yep. Excellent. All right, so um, I, I have to, I, my, um, uh, my disclosures are that I am not an IT expert. I am not an expert in e-learning. And so I have been uh, learning at a very uh, fast rate over the last uh, six weeks uh, how to adapt to this. What I'm going to share today is just some of the things we've done in our program, uh, as well as some of the things that we've observed happen in, uh, when we've tried to uh, switch uh, over to more of an e-learning context. And I'm going to talk about this both from a clinical learning standpoint and, and how moving to uh, e-visits and, and e-learning, how that looked when we switched there, as well as stuff outside of the workplace, like academic cafe, and, and how that has, uh, how we've adapted uh, in that context. And I'll, uh, I'll start here. Um, this is, uh, what we found is when we moved into uh, an e-visit uh, environment, um, our idea was that, well, it's just an electronic clinic. It will operate the same way. And uh, the message I got back very, very quickly from our residents is that they don't enjoy watching attendings have phone calls uh, with patients. Um, and they, they don't get a whole lot uh, out of it. 
But that was what was happening a lot because we really didn't think about the workflow uh, when uh, we when we shifted over to uh, e visits. And it took us a while to figure out a way to make sure that our residents were actually having responsibility in the initial part of the uh, visit, doing the history, uh, completing an assessment and presenting the case to the attending. But it also gave me a, a, some time to actually step back and think about how, how do we actually run clinics? And, and are, is the way we have our clinics set up actually really good from a learning standpoint? And it got me thinking about um, sort of the ideas related to self-regulated learning. And, and this is Zimmerman's model of um, cyclical uh, model of self-regulated learning. And, and it made me think about how when how when we run clinic, what do we what do we actually do? And you know, I can say in internal medicine, this is typically our model. We tell the resident, you go in first, then when you're done, come back and then we'll chat about the patient, and then we'll go in together and talk with the patient. And when you think about how this model actually plays out for our residents, um, they really don't have that uh, in that uh, upper left side, that forethought, that preparation time. They review the chart quickly, but go in without really having had a chance to uh, think about how they're going to approach that patient. The busier clinics have gotten, the more it's become go in, see the patient, come out and talk with me. The other thing that happens with that is the need to move the clinic along with efficiency has gotten away from us really having the time to think, reflect, and uh, really consolidate learning that happened in seeing that patient. Um, and so in fact, a lot of the post-performance uh, stuff is also uh, lost. And, and we've really emphasized that our residents now largely go in, they do the task, they do the activity, but without the preparation, and without the follow-up learning. And this sort of stood out to me as, uh, as, it, as it really started to reflect, not just on the e-learning, but, but how we've been doing ambulatory medicine for some time. Another problem that came up um, is obviously there's been some big shifts and we have too little clinic time and we had too many residents assigned to ambulatory rotations when the clinics weren't happening. But what was interesting is we still had this problem, too little time in clinic. Um, our clinics are still compressed. These are uh, e-visits that are happening at a fairly quick rate, um, but the clinics are few and far between. And it, what stood out to me um, is that we have too much time and too little time at, all at the same time. Um, thinking about how we could fix this uh, and thinking about sort of that model of self-regulated learning. It started to work and we haven't implemented this. This is something that we're, uh, that we're working on right now, but this is something that we're actually looking at adopting and probably adopting moving forward once we're no longer necessarily living in it, uh, in a purely e-visit world. Um, but what I wanna do is have the residents go to the attending the day before, get two assigned charts and actually do what I'm gonna call a pre-visit for lack of a better term, uh, where they have, uh, now that residents in particular can get their OTN uh, accounts, they will complete a visit with the patient the afternoon or the day before. They take the history, they generate their differential, and then they actually have time before the clinic itself to reflect on the case, summarize the history, uh, and do some reading around the case. When the clinic comes, they actually start the clinic by presenting the summarized cases and getting the feedback. They then essentially complete the consult by doing a joint e-visit with the attending. And then they can fill out the report and submit it. What this does is it creates space for learning. Um, it allows them to sort of dig in, put their own thinking, make their own hypotheses for the cases, um, make their own plan, and then test them with the attending, and then also figure out what they've missed and what additional history is important to collect from the patient. One thing that we've noticed in talking with a number of our attendings is that particularly with the more complicated medical cases, we often have very low expectations about what our residents are going to be able to accomplish in clinic. Uh, and the thinking, part of the thinking with this is that we're gonna be able to raise our expectations of. Uh, of our residents because they're going to have this space, this time to actually think and read around their cases. Um, so
So when you're, when you're thinking about this, this model allows us not only to complete this loop, but allows them to go through it realistically twice. Um, and my hope is that this is really going to significantly reinforce learning. Um, I think it's time that we not just adapt to e-visits, but use this as a chance to rethink our, uh, our educational model in the ambulatory setting. So that's what I'm going to talk. That's all I have to say about clinical learning. Um, and I'm going to talk about academic half day now. And, uh, you know, I, I was thinking, okay, um, we're used to our academic half day being largely lectures about topics given by our faculty. They last two hours. They're roughly 100 to 120 slides. Um, and uh, some of them are fantastic. Um, some of them are not so. Um, but very few of them are actually interactive, engaging, active learning sessions. And we've been toying with, for this, uh, toying with this for a while about the fact that we want to move away from a lecture-based academic half day, and we want to move to case space. And, uh, and I want to, before I even get into this, I want to give uh, Dr. Sparrow Wad an enormous amount of credit because she has done a fantastic, uh, some fantastic work the last month helping us build a case-based, problem-based learning uh, curriculum that we're moving forward with. Um, and along with our uh, education consultants and admin support to, in putting the IT stuff together. We decided we were not going to take our lectures that were not always well received and put them in uh, a Zoom context. Uh, we wanted to do better. We wanted an active learning model. We wanted something that really forced increased participation. Uh, we want it to be team-based and interactive. And obviously, uh, currently, we want it to be socially distanced. And, and this really meant leveraging some uh, technologies, uh, technology to accomplish this. And Microsoft to the rescue. Um, OneNote is something we have been beginning to adopt over the last two years, making class notebooks uh, for which we use our, our learning plans are embedded in them. This year, we've uh, adopted Microsoft Teams, which is a fantastic online platform for creating uh, teams that can do uh, video chats and running uh, teaching sessions. And then uh, Microsoft Forms, which we hadn't been using much before, um, but allows uh, you to submit information, submit answers to uh, tests. What this, is, what this suite has allowed us to do is to actually create virtual uh, PBL groups. Uh, and is actually turned out to work really, really well. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit. Uh, you know, I'm going to go back to this for a second. One of the big advantages of this is our residents rotate regionally as well as locally, and they're in different places. They're sometimes at the at the do, sometimes at Providence Care, sometimes at KGH. Our residents no longer have to be in the same uh, city, uh, let alone same hospital now to run a PBL session. Um, they also have a place where they can have notes and stuff, uh, notes from sessions stored and uh, case summaries placed. In terms of our curriculum development, how we approach this, uh, first thing we did is develop cases and because Dr. Awad was tackling this, uh, we started with endocrine cases and, and we selected a case example that we were gonna use to help faculty in developing their cases. We then created a case development guide. So telling our faculty, this is how you're going to develop cases. And then we recruited our faculty through the divisions in medicine. Uh, and we've, we've had fantastic update. Right now we have a number, uh, we have some specialties, uh, subspecialties that are heavily ambulatory focused. And some of the faculty have more time right now to be focused on this. And we've really been able to take advantage of that. And then we made our resident teams. The workflow for these sessions, the senior residents are actually the group facilitators. Our R3s are serving as our group facilitators. Um, but in addition, we have a single faculty su supervisor during their PBL session who simply logs into MS Teams, Microsoft Teams, uh, and is available to answer chat and video as the sessions go on. Teams submit their answers uh, to the questions in MS forms. And on Thursday at uh, around noon, uh, we take up the session with a, uh, with a summary session. Uh, this has been fantastically successful. It's great uptake from the residents. They love it and they say they're getting far more out of our academic half day than they were before. And, uh, I think this leads actually really to my key points. Uh, really, uh, one of the things we've learned is 
just let's not just move what we've been doing previously into an online platform. Let's do better. Um, the other thing we've learned is let's not aim for perfection before we roll out. Let's aim for something good and then learn as we roll out. Uh, but this is really a huge opportunity to do something uh, new, something better, um, and something that will be in progress for some time. Uh, and the final thing I'll say is listen to what your residents say. Uh, they have a lot of good thoughts on how to improve uh, e-learning experiences. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, David, for this very helpful insights and really for highlighting um, the need and emphasizing the move from online teaching to online learning. So let's not really emphasize online teaching. Let's talk about online learning and what can it look like and what are opportunities, especially when it comes to clinical learning and the academic hub days. Um, as we mentioned, we're going to leave some room. I'm hoping for questions at the end because we do have um, three other presenters today. Um, so I'm going to move. Um, I'm going to move on to um, maybe Jessica. Would you like to go next? Yeah, um, sure. And then I'm, I'm, I'm collecting questions as I go. I already see some questions in the Q&A forum. I'm just going to share my screen here. Can, is my audio okay? Perfect. Okay, awesome. Great. All right, and can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, excellent. Okay, well, um, thanks everyone for joining us today to talk about uh, this interesting topic. Uh, for those of you who might not know me, I'm a physiatrist at Providence Care Hospital. Uh, my clinical areas are mainly acquired brain injury and peripheral nerve injury and spasticity management. Uh, but I'm also doing some research into coaching in the clinical learning environment. Um, and I'd like to thank Claudiana for thinking of me um, to present at this panel today. Um, and I want to start by saying that, uh, just like David mentioned, I felt like a huge imposter when Claudiana asked me to be involved in this panel, um, alongside all the other folks that are here today. Um, you know, during my residency training, I actually feel like I was very privileged to learn from some of the best educators how to deliver formal teaching, informal teaching, bedside teaching, but this sort of teaching is something that I was never trained how to do. Um, so providing education in a virtual environment is new to all of us. So I'm by no means an expert in virtual teaching. Uh, many of you who are here today are probably much more expert than I am, uh, but we are all learning new things about virtual teaching and virtual clinical work at the same time in this new environment. Uh, so what I'd like to do today is share a few pearls that I've learned over the past couple of months. So my portion of this presentation today is really going to focus on how to engage learners in informal bedside teaching, quote unquote bedside teaching from a distance. Uh, and also while finding opportunities to co-learn new skills with medical learners. So I'm going to use an example from an innovation that we have used successfully in physical medicine and rehabilitation to illustrate these objectives. So to set the stage, uh, PM&R, or Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, is a five-year residency training program. Uh, we have a pretty small program, so currently we have six residents, normally one resident per year. Um, occasionally we have some elective or clerkship medical students rotating with us as well. Uh, but that makes for a pretty small group at our weekly academic half days. Um, during academic half day, residents review core teaching topics. Uh, but in the first part of academic half day, traditionally we have incorporated case rounds or physical examination skills. And these have been a really integral part of PM&R residency training. Uh, traditionally, case rounds looked like a small group of residents with one faculty, plus or minus the medical students that are there. Um, and we would meet on the ward and spend maybe up to an hour at a patient's bedside, focusing on interviewing skills, specific physical examination skills, or uh, learning about unique or interesting cases. And there's really nothing quite like learning this information from a patient directly. Um, and hearing their story, being able to ask them questions, understanding the biopsychosocial uh, aspects of their care, um, and then problem solving as a group and discussing some clinical reasoning strategies or management plans. 
But obviously this type of learning model is really challenging during COVID. We can't very well gather a group of learners at a patient's bedside when we're trying to maintain physical distancing and judiciously use PPE. Uh, so we can't bring this small crowd of people to the bedside for learning purposes anymore. So our challenge was uh, to kind of find a way to recreate uh, or modify or adapt something that we knew was already really valuable and worked well in our program while still uh, maintaining uh, these regulations. So we decided to get a little bit creative with our case rounds. Uh, we've talked a little bit about some technology, uh, but we implemented a virtual bedside rounds model using the OTN hub. So a lot of us use OTN for uh, video consultations with patients. Um, they, you can use it for learning events as well. And so uh, you can invite guests via OTN uh, by entering their name and email, and you can add up to 19 guests to uh, an event. And then you can, uh, you can change the title of the event and call it whatever you want. Uh, and then you schedule the event and it sends a link for everyone to uh, join by email. So when we actually did this, um, one faculty member was present at the bedside with the technology with the patient, um, but everybody else would be able to log in remotely. So at Providence Care, we actually have, uh, thanks to actually Dr. Apparetti and Dr. Ritzma, who have some grant funding for virtual stroke care, uh, we have some nice technology where we have a computer on wheels with a great video camera, uh, a, a webcam uh, that has zoom capabilities. So meaning you can actually zoom in and zoom out, uh, not the zoom that we're using today. Um, so uh, when, once you're logged into OTN, uh, everybody remotely can see the patient and the patient can see everybody who's logged in there. So obviously we um, obtained consent from the patient to participate in this uh, pilot learning event in advance. And we again confirmed the consent from the patient at the time of the encounter. And we had each individual person introduce themselves because sometimes you can't see everybody on the screen from the patient's view. Uh, what is also really nice about OTN, and you can kind of see at the bottom of this screen, uh, if you use Google Chrome, which um, OTN Hub works best on Google Chrome, you can actually share content as well. So what we did is following the bedside encounter, we uh, I literally took the computer to a different room um, and uh, was able to share some content with the residents. Uh, so uh, in this specific case, uh, we talked about um, an interesting case of neuroanatomy related to herniation syndromes and Kernahan's notch phenomenon. Uh, we talked about relevant anatomy of the brainstem and the corticospinal tract. And so it was a nice kind of wrap up of all of that clinical reasoning and tying it in with what we were seeing with the patient's finding. So um, this innovation was multi-purpose. I think one of the most important things that we value is maintaining some sense of normalcy for our residents during this really unpredictable time. Um, we wanted to demonstrate to our residents that their learning is still really important and we know that they value those case rounds, those bedside rounds. So we wanted to find a way to still, um, uh, still integrate that into their learning. Uh, so rather than take the approach of cancel everything, we've, we've adapted it. Um, as an added bonus, uh, I think the silver lining of this is that it has given us an opportunity to train our learners in things that we were never trained how to do. I never learned how to do a virtual consultation, a virtual physical examination when I was in residency. And now we have the opportunity to co-learn these skills together. Um, and to be honest, some of our residents have uh, taught us some uh, really useful uh, tips and tricks for virtual physical examinations that I wouldn't have thought of without them. So I'll end on this note just by saying that uh, just because we're facing a challenge doesn't necessarily mean that we have to look at that challenge as an obstacle. Uh, we can look at that challenge as an opportunity for innovation. There's a really great 
um, article, there's a couple of articles actually in the Harvard Business Review about how constraints are good for innovation. And I would encourage you to read this if this is at all interesting to you. Um, sometimes some of those challenges can feel scary, but can also foster creative thinking when we're forced to solve problems in different ways. So I would challenge all of you in your own individual programs to think outside the box when it comes to adapting all, uh, to these challenges in your own programs. Thank you very much, Jessica, and I appreciate you starting with um, a reminder how this is really unmapped territory for all of us and, and um, reminding us, all of us to be kind and, and patient with ourselves and others. Um, and, and I really appreciate it. I'm sure others did as well. The, the practical example that you gave in terms of how, um, how you're trying to adopt and adapt to a different form and a different kind of learning for bedside teaching. Thanks so much for that. Um, Faisal, could could I have you please to go next? Sure. <clears throat> uh, do you mind I'll, going up the slides? I'll be sharing the screen. Just give me um, sort of a heads up or a prompt when you'd like me to move slides. Um, can you see it okay? Can everyone see it okay? Uh, we can see your screen. Can't quite see the slides. Yet. You don't see the slides? Perfect. Yeah, now we can. Oh, excellent. Wonderful. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Um, so I'm Faisal Haji. I'm a, a, an assistant professor in neurosurgery and um, a medical education scholar for the Faculty of Health Sciences. Uh, I'm going to take a slightly different tack than what you heard from um, uh, David and Jessica. Uh, they had some very practical advice on how this uh, looks on the ground when you apply virtual teaching. I'm going to have a bit more of a um, esoteric and uh, educational scholarship as well as educational theory view. I'm going to tell you a little bit of evidence around how and we can think about virtual teaching. And because I am a surgeon, I'm gonna use a lot of surgical examples, but I'll try to pepper in some other ones as well um, across the health professions. Um, Claudia, you can go ahead to the next slide. I don't have any specific disclosures. Um, so uh, what we're doing now, um, although it seems like it's uh, completely novel and different, and it's something that we're not used to, is not actually all that new. Um, undergraduate teaching, for example, using telemedicine has been around for quite some time. Um, there's been reviews and studies in the medical education literature since the um, late 90s, early 2000s, and it's across the educational spectrum from undergraduate through to continuing professional development. Um, and so it's, it's something that we have been engaged in, um, but it's something that we're having to learn in a new and different way um, and that everybody's having to adapt to whether this is something that you intended to incorporate into your um, teaching or not. Um, you can go to the next slide. So um, it's not surprising, perhaps, that the evidence around the use of virtual methods for instruction, for example, um, this meta-analysis by Cook and colleagues from 2008, um, shows a similar story to other technologies that we've incorporated into our teaching, like simulation. Basically, learners often find these methods very satisfying, and when we compare teaching to other methods or no teaching, um, our students generally learn something. Um, but when we compare virtual methods to other teaching modalities, whether it's in-person instruction or SIM or other things, um, by and large, the outcomes come out as a wash. In the context of COVID-19, that's probably good for us because it means that we can, for the time being, just assume that from an educational outcome perspective, we're probably gonna have analogous outcomes from using virtual tools. Um, but the next logical question is what we can do to optimize these virtual environments. Next slide. Um, so my bias as a, health professions education scholar is to always start with theory. Um, and fortunately, uh, there is a reasonable basis on which we can do that in this context. Next slide. So um, <clears throat> this is a paper that I came across in Advances in Health Sciences Education, which is I think a, a nice overview of one particular concept that's relevant to virtual teaching in our discussion, which is observational learning. Um, if you haven't seen it or don't know much about observational learning, it's worth looking at, particularly if you're operating around teaching of um, procedural skills and clinical skills. Um, basically, uh, it amounts to a, a group of theories arising from psychology and motor learning that suggest that we can actually effectively learn um, in the absence of physical practice and simply by observing others. Um, Albert Bandura is credited as the first um, psychologist to really articulate this in what he called the observational learning theory in the early 1960s. Um, and it was a precursor to what he then created, which was the social cognitive theory of learning, which is also relevant to what we're talking about. 
Um, but the basic underpinning of what Bender articulated was that there are four aspects or phases to the process of learning through observation. Um, that's the first is attention. Um, you have to actually pay attention to what's being presented to you. The second is retention. You have to encode that in memory in some fashion. The third is reproduction or imitation. And in the context of motor skills learning, for example, um, that would be reproduction of um, um, the motor task. Um, and then reinforcement, which is practice. Um, and so there's also some neurophysiological basis um, underpinning the ideas around uh, observational learning. So there's a mirror neuron network that was originally identified in the premotor cortex of monkeys um, and which humans have an analog network for. And these neurons are observed to fire when someone is watched performing, when someone watches another person perform a skilled motor action. And these mirror neurons fire in a similar fashion to if you were performing the skill yourself. And they're actually activated when you then go and try and reinforce the practice or imitate that skill. Um, so the idea is that we can, in fact, have a neurophysiological basis for the idea that observing can lead to productive learning. Um, a lot of the data that I'm going to show you next from um, the health professions education literature is both based around technical skills, but I think they, it really can apply to a broader range of concepts, pretty much any situation in which um, a skill is being taught or a behavior is being taught, <clears throat> and you want to establish a mental model for a learner, and then um, have them use that mental model to approach a similar task in the future. And that could be anything from closing a wound to communicating with a patient or to identifying key features on a pathology slide, for instance. Next slide. Um, so how do we optimize the design of these types of environments? Um, and uh, what uh, evidence do we have from the, the health professionals education literature to guide us? Next slide. <clears throat> uh, the group that's done a really good um, job in, in studying this is um, Lawrence Grierson's uh, lab out of McMaster University. And uh, they, this is one example of a study that they've published in the last couple of years um, around observational learning and observational practice. Um, and in this study, the central uh, question was, um, we know that observation is a key part of observational learning. You have to have something that learners can look at. Um, but what, is, what exactly should you be presenting? And in general, we refer to this as the model. Um, and should it be an expert model, which is flawless and without any sort of um, errors in it? Should it be a flawed model, for example, a novice performing whatever task or skill you're trying to impart? Um, what's the best way to go? And in this study, what they essentially found was that um, learners benefit from both. Uh, and when you have a presentation of an expert or flawless model alongside a novice or flawed or errorful model, um, learners benefit from seeing the and, and comparing and, and making distinctions between those two performances. And ideally, um, though that should be accompanied with feedback from experts so that novices can reflect on what they're seeing, identify errors in performance or in the performance of the task, and then have corroboration from experts to say, yes, in fact, those were the errors that were present. And you'll see this theme come up in a few of the other studies that I'll show you. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, Lawrence's group has also figured out a couple of other things that optimize observational learning. Uh, in the study on the left, residents practiced a fundamentals of laparoscopic surgery PEG task, um, and they were engaged in observational practice using both expert and novice models. Um, but they changed the practice schedule. And so this is something that's been studied pretty rigorously in the surgical education literature. What's the best way to sequence practice when you're trying to learn something? And we do this a lot in sim or even when we're engaged in um, learning in the operating room. And in general, um, when you use a blocked type of approach where you present all of the expert videos first and then all of the novice videos after, um, that leads to an initial bump in performance, but they, the learning isn't as robust as when you use something like an interleaved practice strategy where you're basically um, having a novice video, then an expert video, then another novice video, then another expert video, and you're kind of going back and forth between them. Um, from an education theory perspective, it's known as contextual interference. Um, and this is an effect that's been shown to be beneficial in various aspects of surgical lab-based uh, surgical education and simulation. And now we have evidence that it actually works even when you're just observing somebody doing something. Um, in the study on the right, um, nursing students were taught how to administer a gluteal injection through a video-based um, observational practice um, methodology. And um, they were then asked to self-assess their own performance against the, uh, the simulated performance of an expert that was recorded on a video. And then they were able to engage in an online community where they got peer-to-peer -peer feedback. And that group that had all three of those things, their own self-assessment, the expert model, and the online collaborative 
peer-to-peer -peer feedback outperformed everybody else. And so the idea here is that the more opportunities that we provide for cognitive and collaborative interactivity with the educational materials, the better learning outcomes we're likely to observe. And you heard this come up in David's talk when he said, we can't just take a lecture, throw it onto Zoom and assume that people are going to get um, productive learning out of that. We need to provide opportunities for them to engage with the educational material, interact with it in a cognitive fashion, and really um, sort of sink their teeth in. Next slide. Um, and we all know that feedback is an essential component to learning. Um, and fortunately, virtual environments, although it's um, more difficult than in traditional uh, formats to do this, um, they, they, are, they can be well suited to providing both peer and expert feedback. Um, in the study that you see on the slide, the authors developed an online platform for um, observational practice and education networking. And they used a virtual patient simulation, but this could have been a video recording of a patient interaction or some other um, um, online content um, and they used it for cultural competence training and they demonstrated in this study that you can this approach doesn't necessarily have to be limited to technical skills training you can apply it to a variety of clinical skills next slide um, i just wanted to quickly touch on um, observation learning and simulation um, there if you could go to the next slide claudia there's uh there's a pretty good theoretical basis for the idea that we could actually mix um, the observational learning techniques using video-based instruction with the traditional simulation type of techniques that we use. I don't have time to go into the model that I have on the screen here, but I wanted to put this up if anybody's interested in how you might be able to put these things together. Um, there is pretty good theoretical um, studies in this. Um, this uh, paper does a really good job of providing a model for how you might do that. If you go to the next slide. Um, this is an interesting study by O'Regan and colleagues because um, they summarized all of the data uh, looking at um, the observer role that um, participants who are engaged in a simulation could play. And so they were looking at whether the um, use of or how, the position of being an observer rather than the person who was engaged in the simulation had an impact on learning. And in fact, they found that in many cases, being an observer was superior in terms of learning outcomes to being somebody who was actually engaged in the simulation activity that itself. And in part, that was because it created space for people to be able to reflect on the simulation that they were observing as a whole and have conversations about what was happening. Um, so again, it's this idea that just because you're observing doesn't mean that you won't be able to engage in productive learning. Um, and we can think about how this might apply to even the traditional methods that we use in instruction now. Next slide. I'm almost done. Um, there's uh, also data that says that we can combine instructional methods. So just because you're doing virtual teaching doesn't mean that you can't take that and use it as a preparation for something in the future. Um, so in this study uh, by Cheng and colleagues, um, they actually used uh, an online video-based instruction combined with peer-to-peer um, -peer, um, online collaboration and videos that were what they called spot the difference kind of um, tasks where you had, again, um, a errorful performance and then um, one where the errors were identified and learners had to basically go through and spot all of the differences between the good video and the bad video um, analogous to the expert novice comparison for video instruction um, and they showed that that was superior in preparing learners for simulation training and you could argue that would be the same for preparing for clinical learning um, and the interesting thing was that when you used a mastery learning approach where you wanted them to get to a certain level of proficiency in performing a particular skill, um, those that had this kind of observational learning um, got there much faster, which was a much more efficient use of simulation and non-simulation resources. Next slide. Um, so a few other considerations. Next slide. Um, this was a study from radiology. I threw it in there just to show that I, I can look at literature that's not just surgical education. Um, and they were looking at telemedicine as an uh, opportunity to train radiology skills in undergraduate students. Um, and uh, just a couple of key points. Uh, in general, they found that it was beneficial to keep sessions to less than 60 minutes because everybody's attention spans out um, and you can't really get much productive learning beyond that. Um, they really needed to have a 10 minute break somewhere in that, uh, that 60 minute period. Um, and again, the use of multiple instructional methods, um, images, clinical features, lectures, self-directed study, all combined together was generally more productive than any one method alone. And the next slide. Uh, so the last thing is that um, we can be 
creative about how we incorporate patients, whether they're um, patient, uh, standardized patients or real patients into our interactions. Um, and there's lots of evidence from the nursing literature in particular that should suggest that um, we can really have a lot of benefit from a learning perspective if we incorporate patient, um, patient perspectives into our teaching. Um, and so I just wanted to point you towards this paper as a sort of overview. This was a randomized controlled trial where they actually integrated standardized patients and compared it to video-based instruction and saw a significant improvement in knowledge and skill um, for an entire class of nurses that were taught using this methodology. Next slide. Um, so I'm just going to end with um, some future directions and thinking about research. I'm hoping that this, uh, what I've presented to you right now, will spark some interest if you're going to be engaging in this kind of uh, teaching activity to think about how we might be able to incorporate scholarship into it as well. Um, I've listed a few potential questions that I've come up with, but this is no my, by, by no means exhaustive, and I think there's a lot more that we can talk about. Um, first, there's a lot about how we design virtual teaching that remains to be understood. So the studies that I cited from McMaster are a great start, but more needs to be done on this. Um, for example, uh, what do we know about existing best practices in designing um, other educational technologies like SIM or serious games, and how can they apply to virtual teaching? Um, we've got a few examples that I've cited today, but a lot more opportunities for research there. Um, how do these strategies impact learner cognition, things like mental workload or cognitive load? Um, how do we, what do we know about the relative efficacy of using these virtual approaches versus in-person training and what potential opportunity for studies as we start to ramp back up to clinical activities in person? Um, and there's also the question of what needs to be done in these environments to optimally engage learners. So you heard um, David initially talk about how if you just have residents watch an attending make a phone call and engage with a patient, that's not going to be very productive. Um, so what do we need to do in virtual um, teaching that actually promotes engagement among learners? That, that's a big question that remains to be seen. The bottom line is that there's a lot about observational learning and virtual teaching that we don't know as yet. Um, and so going forward, if this is something that you're going to be engaging with, I encourage you to think about incorporating a research question or two into your activities. And I'd be happy to discuss further how you might do that and what theories or approaches or evidence might inform your, your strategy. So. Hazel, thank you so much for grounding our work in educational theories and especially for um, curating, collating for us some signature readings in um, observational learning theory and, and social and other social cognitive theories. Um, and like you said, I, I really appreciated the questions at the end for those who are interested to take this further. Um, there is lots of room for improvement. There, there are lots of unknowns currently in, in virtual clinical teaching and learning. Thank you. Ramana, can I turn the mic to you? Are we okay with um, sharing the screen? Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me okay now? Fantastic. Or is it still bad? Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm just going to take maybe five minutes of the time and just give some time for the questions. I'm not going to talk about uh, uh, any of the theoretical aspects that my colleagues have very nicely touched upon. I'm going to just give you some practical tips of implementing um, solutions on the ground or on the floor when you're um, mm -hmm. When you want to do bedside teaching, just touching upon a, a few points that Dr. Uh, Trier has uh, highlighted. Um, so I'll not be talking about uh, also uh, the platforms to use for didactic lectures so like Microsoft Teams that Dr. Taylor already discussed upon. So what we have uh, put together in neurology is a, is a bedside teaching, a multipurpose unit basically uh, for uh, Used for telemedicine, for bedside grounding, and even for bedside teaching, uh, and also for uh, uh, could be repurposed for use in emergency situations if needed. So it's an all-in-one sort of unit. And as we put together this unit, we learned a lot of uh, nuances about uh, trying to use a mobile telemedicine cart on the floor uh, and in the ED sort of situation. And I'll take you to a few of the learning points that we have, and also some tips on how to optimize the equipment to suit your needs. So uh, obviously you need the, the computer and uh, a camera and a microphone and uh, uh, ideally there should be uh, a battery pack mounted onto this mobile unit if you are thinking about it just to maintain the mobility of the unit. 
Um, and whenever you're thinking about a mobile or a portable telemedicine unit, uh, consideration for storage, cleaning, maintenance, who's going to take care of it, where are, how, how can people access the unit as well as the computer mounted on it. These are all some of the logistics that you need to work out. Um, and uh, there should be clear identification of tasks, accountability, and as well as communication protocols on how each person talks to uh, and uses these devices. So, so these are these are uh, the two units that uh, we have available in neurology. The one on the left is my portable research unit that I put together, uh, and uh, the one on the right is something supplied by KHSC for us uh, for the stroke program because we were planning the contingency plans in case our stroke neurologists can't come into the ED either because contamination or uh, um, or because they are sick and can't provide acute stroke care. We just wanted to have some sort of uh, uh, contingency planning, so. Both are pretty similar units. As you can see, they are like a pretty, uh, they have a very small footprint. They are two, two and a half to two by two feet uh, uh, footprint and have a mobile cart with lockable wheels uh, and are quite easily maneuverable. Um, and um, so as you can see, this is a close up of uh, one of the devices. You, um, The unit that Dr. Trier was mentioning in the Providence Care has the same camera. Um, this is a Logitech, uh, uh, a meetup camera. This basically offers the ability to zoom, uh, control the, uh, the direction of the camera, pan and the tilt modes of the camera, and this could be operated with the uh, remote control. It also has a comes with an optional uh, microphone that could be uh, placed close to the patient or the teacher for uh, demonstrating any clinical findings or uh, um, instructions. Um, and um, if you're, we have used it uh, on the neurology floor in Kit 7 for uh, bedside rounding because in neurology, obviously, there's a lot of bedside teaching. Uh, uh, and uh, given the COVID restrictions, we were, uh, the house staff were also uh, segregated, but we didn't want to um, uh, want them to miss out the learning opportunities. So the way we planned this was we had the, uh, one of the resident rounding with the unit uh, with the patient and the senior resident and uh, the rest of the house staff and the attending were on uh, a, a video call uh, with the patient. Uh, and uh, so the uh, resident or one of the house staff was uh, rounding on the patient would go through the usual steps of day-to-day -day history and physical. And uh, we would then uh, teach uh, some examination via video, uh, similar to what Dr. Trier had died in her, uh, uh, alluded in her uh, talk. And um, so we, so if anybody is interested in implementing this sort of a bedside uh, teaching uh, mobile unit, obviously the first thing is uh, it should be implemented in a paced manner with the testing the feasibility and the fidelity of the system, checking, making sure that your communication network and equipment are working. And then the phase two should be mocking with a volunteer as a patient, a teacher, and a handful of learners who can give feedback on how the system is working and phase three would be uh, live teaching. There are traditional telemedicine uh, cards available, but they are very uh, expensive to begin with. That's the biggest barrier. They do have some Rapidly deployed telemedicine card costs a fraction of the actual cost of a conventional telemedicine card to use for bedside teaching. Um, and there are some peripherals you could use for bedside teaching, like uh, uh, there are Bluetooth stethoscope. We have not used it in neurology, uh, but something that you could use. And there are other peripherals that you could plug in. Again, the issues of compatibility and what software support uh, are supported by these peripherals uh, come into question. Um, and uh, as far as the platform goes, you could use uh, regulated or unregulated platforms at the moment, but uh, down the line, eventually, we always recommend using a regulated uh, healthcare platform like OTN Hub or Reacts that we are using could be used for bedside teaching. So, uh, with that, I would conclude in the interest of time. And if you have any questions regarding the practical implementation of any bedside teaching, I'm happy to you can contact me at a later time. Ramona, thank you so much uh, for sharing with us some of the technologies that are available for virtual care, uh, but also for going further and, and, and sharing some of the pros and cons of those technologies. And, and I'm glad you, you made yourself available so when people have questions, perhaps they can 
um, follow up with you directly in terms of what, what could work in their context, in their department. Um, I, I'm mindful of the time. We have three minutes left. So what I've done, I have um, given everyone permission to talk. So if there are any burning questions, uh, please unmute yourself and um, feel free to ask the question. Hey, uh, I got a quick question. It's uh, Phil Gillich, uh, Department of Family Medicine. Um, just for Dr. Taylor, I think the most, uh, you guys are using MS Teams. Any, uh, why did you choose that platform um, that's similar to Google Classrooms? Um, any difference between the two or have you played with any of the similar platforms? Thanks so much. Yeah, so uh, very quickly, MS Teams, the reason we went with it is because all of our residents have an automatic account through Queen's University. And uh, that was something we didn't have to ask them to set up. It also allows us to integrate uh, with OneNote and we have a lot of, we're starting to build class notebooks and those actually integrate seamlessly with MS Teams uh, as well as MS Forms. And so uh, what it essentially did is we residents already all had an account that was linked to uh, other packages that we were already using with them. Uh, very, thank you I, very would much. Just, I would just like to add uh, another point to Dr. Taylor. So MS Teams is actually certified for, uh, uh, is meets the requirements for BHIPAA uh, and is uh, meets the privacy standards and is cleared by the hospital to share a screen for uh, any confidential information if you're sharing any uh, teaching images or something that could be done on MS Teams. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm, and I'm glad you asked that question because one of it was one of the questions on the Q&A chat as well. So thank you for that. All right. Well, I won't keep anyone um, beyond one o'clock. Um, thank you again, everyone. And um, a huge thank you to our panelists. And um, as you heard from all of them, they are available. They're happy. Um, they're happy to contact to be contacted by you. So feel free to follow up with them directly. Um, and if there are any other areas of support that you'd like, or any other topics for future webinars, uh, please let me know, and and we'll make that happen from the faculty development end. I see some comments directed to the panelists. Um, thank you for doing this, and and it was great. So again. Um, just echoing what was said earlier. Thank you so much, Jessica, Ramana, David, and Faisal. We, we really appreciate it. Thank you for sharing your wisdom um, and making the time for all of us. Thanks, Claudia. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.